can I firstly acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land on which we stand and say that as Australia's Federal Health Minister, I appreciate that the burden of diabetes falls most unfortunately and most unfairly on our first Australians and that it is my job, uh, as it is every health minister, to do everything we can to close the gap in Indigenous life expectancy. I'm honoured to be amongst so many uh, people who know so much about this subject and I want to acknowledge you, the work you do, the efforts you make uh, and the commitment that you have. I want to acknowledge you, Judy, as a good friend and colleague. Um, I think the number of women in the federal parliament is starting to increase, perhaps not on our side, but... Um, uh, but as, as, a, as a pioneer, not just a passionate person for her communities from Western Australia, but as a woman in the federal parliament, uh, Judy has been a great mentor and she's taken up this cause with gusto. She um, tracks down me and my colleagues and um, gives us a dose of her thoughts every now and then and uh, John Zalsberg does and so do all of you when you find us. So uh, that's important because ultimately as the... Minister responsible for a budget that's going to be, I think, $79 billion uh, in 2020, um, but doesn't have the ability to draw any more dollars into that overall funding package. The issues always are, within that federal budget, how we allocate the health dollar to deliver the best result. And every time I receive uh, entreaties, and I'm not talking about the people in this room, but uh, entreaties about uh, causes that perhaps aren't on our radar, and this one very much is, I always ask the question, so where would the money come from? Because in order to find money for one pursuit, we have to take it away from something else. That's the tough job of health ministers and governments, and we, we're up for those tough decisions because we absolutely have to. Because if we just accept that the health... Uh, portfolio doesn't have a continuing reform agenda, uh, we don't achieve the things that we need to. It's just not a matter of steadying the ship and sailing it forward. It's the matter of driving that reform process in every single corner of the portfolio. Uh, I, I'm really um, uh, interested in diabetes. Uh, uh, diabetes is represented in my close family members, both type 1 and type 2. Now, my dad won't mind me mentioning him. He's 98. He was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in his early 40s um, because he was losing weight and he was getting very, you know, skinnier and skinnier and l more and more fatigued and he was absolutely shocked that this was the diagnosis. Anyway, uh, he did what I don't think I've, uh, anyone else would do, uh, was completely take control of what he ate and how he exercised from that point on uh, with military precision, which drove us all mad in the household and sometimes still does. But um, he's a perfect example of how if you, you know, if you really manage your diabetes well, and I know this isn't the case for everyone with type 2 diabetes, it progresses at different rates, but if you really manage it well, you do the extraordinary and his doctors have always told me privately how extraordinary that is. But there are so many people, and again, I'm referring to people I know very well who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes who don't do very much at all because uh, they don't feel any different, they don't look any different, they want to keep doing the things they've been doing and they really don't know, you know, what, what it's all about. The role, therefore, of our diabetic educators is vital if they can get them in the room and talk to them um, because that's the key to preventing, I think, some of these alarming statistics from getting out of control. I think at the late end of the late 1980s, we had a rate of diabetes in Australia of 1.5% and, and it's now 5%. And you all know, and I'm not going to repeat the statistics to you, um, what the burden of disease is producing in terms of economic cost, productivity loss and individual loss of well-being. So this really is a challenge governments, you know, have to, have to take on and have to take seriously. So... Um, the diabetes strategy is coming through, the implementation groups there, the advisory groups there. I know it all sounds incredibly bureaucratic, but it is happening, it is progressing, it will make a difference. And some of the key things I think that will make sure it does make a difference are first and foremost, um, and, and because this strategy is something that I sit around the table with my state ministerial colleagues and discuss, there has to be coordination between state and federal governments. Um, you know, if we, if we consider that we're probably close to uh, well, well over 900,000 hospital admissions with diabetes as a cause, you know, that's something that 
primary care has to work very closely with the hospital system to reduce. And our reforms in health are about exactly that. By the way, when I became health minister, one of my predecessors said, you know the average term of a health minister is 18 months. So, uh, by the way, I've just passed 18 months. So, um, <laughs> you're here for a good time, not for a long time. And if you want to do something, you really need to get on with it. So, we did. Um, at the end of 2014, we kicked off the two, I think, central reforms to health. And there's lots of other things happening around the side. They are the review of the MBS. So, I've got you know, clinical groups. Um, and very brave specialists, because they're taking on their colleagues, um, going through the items and, 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 and saying, well, this is where we need investment and this is where we perhaps don't, and actually rewriting the Medicare benefits schedule, which hasn't been done for 30 years. Uh, that's ongoing and that makes perfect sense. The other thing in primary care is our healthcare homes model. I want to take a couple of minutes to talk about that, because it will affect those who have uh, diabetes, because it, it is for those with chronic and complex conditions. So if you take the top 25% of patients with chronic and complex conditions, they are the candidates for the first uh, iteration of the healthcare homes model. Uh, the very first though is the trial and that's what we're about to do now, enrolling 65,000 patients in 200 medical practices in 10 of our primary health networks to be part of healthcare homes. Now, the purpose of this is to start moving away from the very transactional basis of Medicare, which um, works well in some models of primary care, but I can't tell you how many GPs I talk to who are frustrated by not being able to do the things that they know need, you know, not to be able to provide the, the, the whole of patient support for individuals with chronic conditions, uh, often with two, three or four chronic conditions. And that's absolutely vital because... Um, you know, we know that that's the secret to improved health and better outcomes. So what we're going to say is, for these patients, we will provide general practice quarterly bundled payments and we will say inside those payments, uh, bring on the allied health professionals you need, the pharmacists you need, the exercise physiologists, whatever you need, including the digital interventions. Uh, App-based, so sensible. Um, you know, IT-based, uh, 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 telepresence, because so much of that isn't funded by Medicare now, so that particularly rural and regional people are not disadvantaged. And you tell us how you, ma how you want to manage those patients. In fact, you don't need to tell us. You just need to report to us that, that over time, uh, it's quality practice, it's best practice, and their health outcomes are improving. You know, y young doctors say to me, well, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't want a nine to five regular workplace. I don't want the doors of my surgery to open at nine and close at five and everything I do outside, the, outside those hours. And many doctors do a, a great deal outside those hours. is not remunerated or even understood particularly well by Medicare. So this frees up the innovative models uh, that, that people want to design for the communities they represent in the best possible way. I always want to put those communities and those patients at the centre. But you all know that the real key to this is empowering the patient. Because inside that model, it doesn't make any difference what model you have. If the patient is a passive recipient of the things that are done kind of to them, it's not, particularly in type 2 diabetes, it's not going to get very far. Um, and certainly with type 1 diabetes, you want the, the, the person um, taking control early on, um, and that's often in childhood, and that is just so important. So healthcare homes is all about that as well, because if you say to the person, we're going to do these things to you, uh, you've got this many appointments with the diabetic educator, you've got this, this and this, uh, yeah, you look, it, 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 it might go some way, but if you say to the patient, how can we provide you with the tools and the support that you need in your lifestyle, and everyone's lifestyle is different. So therefore, my responsibility in government is to deliver the policy that makes that happen. Um, it, it's very easy to think we can design it in Canberra, we can work it out here, and we can just sort of send it out to every part of Australia. Uh, we've done that a lot in health policy in the past, the primary health networks that I just mentioned briefly are actually a changed approach. So we're saying 31 primary health networks across the country, and a lot of people aren't quite sure what they are. It is early days. They are not providers of services. They are commissioners of services. Their expertise, therefore, is in business commissioning and in making the best possible decisions about the allocation of the dollars. And they get substantial dollars, and they're in sort of 
quite broad bucket, so that gives them some flexibility. But absolutely critically, their decisions are informed by clinical committees and by consumers. So they can't just kind sort of dream up what they think is the right thing or look after their favourite people or give money to cer certain outfits because it's easy. They actually have to demonstrate that they're being informed by their local people because what works in this part of Sydney certainly doesn't work in northwest Western Australia. I was in the Kimberley last Friday um, uh, kicking off a process which is very important, a, a, a suicide prevention roundtable um, in parts of the Kimberley and, and, and I've been there several times but one of the messages I always take away and it was said very well by a young woman who was one of the um, traditional owners at the end of the meeting. She stood up and she looked at us all sitting seriously around the table and, you know, uh, service providers and experts. And she said, you know, you all fly in here. You all do, all do quite well out of us, don't you? You know, you come here, you get remote area allowances, you spend a lot of time talking about our problems. Some of you last six months some of you last six weeks, we're here all the time. And you know what? We actually know what works. And it was a moment where I said to her, and she was very cross with me, I should say, um, because she thought, you know, uh, you know, this is just another talk fest from government. Um, and I said, well, it's my job for it not to be another talk fest from government, but the next time I come, who would you like me to sit down with? And she said, all the unsung heroes at the coalface. All the people who go out into their community every day who know what works and can tell you what works. And I'm telling you this story not because it's completely um, analogous with what we want to do here, but it's an important principle, which is that my job is not to say what works. My job is to say, how do we make that into a policy? How do we make that into a funding stream? And how do I get it signed off by the Treasurer and the Finance Minister? Because it has to be affordable. You know, how do we do all those things? So with the advice and the, and the interest and the ideas that, you know, even are just in this room, I know that we have lots and lots of things we can do. So please don't think that we're constrained inside, you know, existing streams of funding, policy, or it's always been done this way. That's not necessarily the case. Now I want to finish on, well, one of my favourite areas of health um, is medicines because medicines transform lives and have given us the best quality of life in Australia um, compared to many of our OECD neighbours and a pharmaceutical benefit scheme that is, I, I know, the envy of the world. Um, and just make the point that it really does matter to me that we can continue to list medicines. And probably in the last um, 12 months, we've listed several medicines for for type 2 diabetes and I remember standing in my local pharmacy with a, a young man, well he wasn't that young, but he travelled some distance to be there to be part of the announcement for Bijurian which um, as I understand it is for a certain subset of type 2 diabetes maybe with um, a lot of insulin resistance. Anyway, you're the experts but you'll know Bijurian because it's been around but it hadn't been on the PBS and he said, oh well you know this is how I used to pay for it. Now it's not a drug that's in the hundreds of thousands, but he had still struggled to pay for it. And um, he explained how prior to it being listed in the easy form that it was, he was sort of putting powder in a capsule and shaking it up. And he said, uh, I, s I found out I knew a lot about it and I talked to a lot of, I actually explained to diabetic educators and I explained to a lot of patients because it was so difficult to use. And he and his wife were just absolutely delighted that, in fact, I'm just looking at the Nigerian word out of the window, it seems bizarre, it's appeared in front of me. Um, I'm not trying to give the sponsors a particular shout out here, everybody. I'm trying to give the government a shout out. <laughs> um, but the point is that it, it is our job when medicines are recommended by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. And as I often explain, that's completely arm's length from government. You know, I might personally think a medicine is fantastic and I might know lots of people and I often have a lot of appeals from people, often younger people with late stage cancer. I think, oh, I wish they'd sign off on this medicine. I wish they would. But, you know, there is a process and it's a, it, it's, it's a really good one. Um, but our job in government is to be running this, well, we, we, you know, we're running budget deficits, not budget surpluses, and that in itself is a problem. But, you know, if I'm faced with a $400 million listing of new medicines, um, I find a way to pay for it. I have to find a way inside the 
health portfolio. I can't take anyone else's money. Um, and, and that perhaps gives you a sense of the, some of the challenges with um, making sure that we, you know, we stick to our guns on important things like that and we keep the confidence of the public in us. And I very much want that. There's a lot of, you know, it's interesting, you've come out of the election campaign, there's, you, you know, seem to have been so much politics in, um, in Medicare. Uh, I'm not going to make any political comments here, you'll be relieved to know, except to say that I don't think health should be particularly political. Uh, I can, by the way, be as political as the next person. But ultimately, the things that I'm doing as health minister, I want the next health minister to pick up and do, um, because they actually make sense and they're the right thing to do. And I think for every health minister, uh, that should be uh, the thing that we want most of all. And the second thing we have to bear in mind is that if we, in making those decisions about the health system, keep patients front and centre, at the centre, uh, then I don't think we can go too wrong. But thank you very much for having me. I could talk under wet cement, but I'm really looking forward to the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you.